Hi all, so today we're going to begin a two-part series on intelligence with modules 29 and 30. So what is intelligence? Um, we often measure intelligence by the use of intelligence tests, which are a series of questions or other exercises which attempt to assess people's mental abilities in a way that generates a numerical score so that we can compare one person to another. But does that sound like a real accurate version of what intelligence is? So intelligence, in fact, can be defined as whatever intelligence tests measure. And so whatever we decide that an intelligence test is, that's what we are saying intelligence is. But honestly, we all know that that's not actually the truth. We know people who don't do so well on tests, but are really smart people or, or do really well in other areas. And so we're going to talk about today what is intelligence. For example, those you've all probably taken your SATs, so your college entrance tests measure how good you are at scoring well on that test. Doesn't necessarily mean um, it's a, a, the greatest predictor of how well you're going to do at college or how smart you are. So, how do we define intelligence beyond the test? So, the text defines intelligence as whether it's math or the ability of a rainforest dweller's understanding of plants as the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. So to me, that's not exactly what's being measured on the SAT or GRE for those that are going, or LSAT, for example, for those of you who are going to graduate school. It's the ability for us to be able to adapt and learn from our environment. So is intelligence one thing or is it multiple, fa multiple faceted? So um, here are different theorists who've talked about intelligence. So Charles Spearman talks about the G, the general intelligence. So he views it as a single um, entity. Thurstone um, talked about seven linked clusters of abilities. Gardner talked about eight intelligences. Sternberg, three intelligences. Um, we're going to learn about emotional intelligence and creativity and intelligence, which have um, four and five components, respectively. So general intelligence, also known as G. So Charles Spearman was one of the first people who kind of talked about intelligence um, as a, a mathematical kind of thing. So he performed a factor analysis, which is a mathematical um, procedure where you kind of find the, the commonalities across a series of tests, and that kind of is the underlying factor. If he did this of different skills and found the people who did well in one area also did well in another area. And he speculated that these people had high levels of G, which he construed as general intelligence. Thurstone, if you recall, had seven clusters of abilities. Um, he disagreed with Spearman, um, and he felt like there was not just one measure or trait of intelligence, that there were multiple. So he did his own factor analysis of 56 skills tests and found seven clusters, including verbal comprehension, inductive reasoning, word fluency, spatial ability, memory, perceptual speed, and numerical ability, which is very similar to some of the subtests we now have on the WACE, which is the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, which is the common, most commonly used measure of intelligence. However, further analysis showed that people who were strong in one cluster tended to be strong in other clusters as well, which therefore also supports the notion that there really might be this underlying factor or G. You've probably heard about um, the savant symptom. So these refers to um, people who have kind of isolated skills. Um, you know, they're generally average, but they have these specific skills like they can remember numbers or they're excellent artists, for example. So um, Howard Gardner talked about multiple intelligences and he noted that different people have intelligence ability in different areas. And his research and factor analysis suggests there may be a correlation among these intelligences. So he had, he postulated eight different intelligences, naturalistic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, bodily, kinesthetic, spatial, musical, logical, mathematical, and li linguistic, but that these were all somewhat interrelated. So how does intelligence relate to success? So we know a lot of people who are book smart but don't do so well in life, and people who are life smart who don't do so well in the books. So success in life is impossible to define. However, wealth tends to be related to intelligence test scores, plus um, Focus daily effort and practice, taking 10 years to achieve success level expertise. So that means that even people you know, with different levels of intelligence, if they practice and hone their skills, um, can achieve success. So this supports 
Um, you know, it's also important to have social support and different connections. We all know people who achieve success because of their connections and their love of family and friends. But we also know that people, you know, some people aren't the smartest um, individuals, but they work really hard and they are energetic and they are persistent and they achieve a lot. So there's a lot of different things that, that come into success aside from just kind of the sheer G or intelligence. So um, Robert Sternberg proposed that success in life is related to three different types of abilities, practical intelligence, analytic intelligence, and creative intelligence. And he defined practical intelligence as the expertise and talent that help to complete tasks and manage the complex challenges of life. So this is just like kind of being able to deal with everyday things of life. Analytic intelligence is good problem solving skills and creating it, creative intelligence is the ability to kind of think outside of the box. And he felt that people who were successful had all three of these skills. So creativity refers to the ability to produce ideas that are novel and valuable. And it also, use, people who have creative intelligence can use those ideas to adapt in novel situations. So convergent thinking is a left brain activity that involves singling in on a single correct answer. And oftentimes we're taught that in school in the multiple chest test um, exams that I give you. you know, there's one single correct answer, so it's convergent thinking. But creative thinking uses divergent thinking. So this is what, you know when we're telling you to brainstorm, to come up with multiple new ideas and to come up with multiple different solutions because in life, oftentimes there's more than one way to solve the problem effectively. So does chess involve creativity? Absolutely, you have to be able to see multiple pathways in order to achieve success. So Sternberg also talked about the five components of creativity. There's expertise, um, possessing a well-developed base of knowledge, imaginative thinking, so you have to have some knowledge, but then you also have to have a good imagination. So the ability to see new perspectives, combinations, and, and connections. You also have to be somewhat adventurous, so you have to be able to seek out new experiences, ambiguity, or obstacles. So this is where I'm kind of lacking because I like to stay in my little safe space and I'm not necessarily somebody who is, is able to kind of take as many risks as some other people. You also have to have a strong intrinsic motivation, so you have to be motivated um, to do this stuff. So you don't need a lot of praise or external rewards in order to move forward. And you also have to be um, in a creative environment, which involves being having support, feedback, encouragement, and time to think and space to think. So how to boost your creativity. So um, pursue an interest until you develop an expertise. Allow time for incubation, so sleep on it, with attention away from projects during which the unconscious connections can form, as we talked about um, a little bit when we were talking about how memories are formed. Allow time for mentor, mental wandering, so daydreaming. Um, you know, we're often discouraged from daydreaming because we have to be productive at every single moment, but people who are creative need to have those times where they're able to have those kind of thoughts. And improve our mental flexibility by experiencing other cultures and other ways of thinking. So surround yourself by new and novel experiences and that will boost your creativity. So we hear a lot these days about emotional intelligence and social intelligence. So emotional intelligence involves processing and managing the emotional component of those social situations, in, 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 um, including one's own emotions. Whereas social intelligence refers to the ability to understand and navigate social situations effectively. So components of emotional intelligence include perceiving emotions, so understanding people's emotions, understand, um, understanding what those emotions mean, that there can be multiple emotions presented at once, being able to manage your own emotions, and to use emotions to fuel motivation, creative, and adaptive thinking. So they found that people who have high emotional intelligence um, also have the ability to delay gratification, which can help in pursuing long-term goals. So you know, they can hold off on getting rewards for a long time and can have a lot of persistence. Um, you can also be, you're also able to read other people, and which gives you a lot of success in career and other social situations. So we talk a lot about um, genius. So what does genius correlate with? Overall brain size. Um, the size of some regions of the brain, such as the parietal lobes, tend to be bigger. There's high brain activity in the frontal and parietal lobes, and people who are genius have extra gray matter. They also have extra white matter. So um, intelligence and action seems to involve activity in the frontal part of the lobes. And being in shape, um, you, if you're physically in shape, you use less energy to solve 